morning, if you want to make your way to 1 Peter chapter 1, many of you know that on Friday morning the Lord called my precious 86-year-old mom Doris Dowdy home to be with him. We are thrilled, we are excited because she had wanted to go see her precious Savior for many, many years and uh, what even makes that more celebratory is knowing that in the last few years and particularly the last few months uh, she really did not enjoy life she was uh, in a tent as Paul speaks of our dying bodies of death uh, longing to be with Christ and uh, she doesn't have her eternal body yet but we know that someday when Christ calls us home uh, that she is going to get her new body, according to 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. And so it is really a time of celebration, of rejoicing, and Marcy and I appreciate and continue to appreciate so many of your heartfelt condolences, your prayers, and uh, we want to invite you, if you're available, that we're going to be celebrating her life on Friday at the Sunset Funeral Homes on Wrestler here on the west side, and uh, that'll be at noon. There will be a viewing at 11, and for those that can afford the, the extra time, you certainly don't need to feel obligated to any of it, but there will be a, a graveside service at the Fort Bliss Cemetery at 2 o'clock. And all of that, if God is willing, uh, will be on Friday this coming week. So uh, thank you so much for your prayers and your heartfelt sympathy and your friendship. Uh, today is uh, just, <laughs> we're really going to jettison along a little faster. You know, I, I was thinking about this, we've been averaging two verses a sermon in Peter. And I had warned you guys that it was going to be a slow go. I want you to know today I'm excited to say if God is willing, we're going to get through four verses today. <laughs> so we're going to uh, look into verses 13 through 16. Let's read it. Let's pray, and then let's just jump right in. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 to 16. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children... Do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Father, you alone are holy. You are separate set apart other than sinners and any created object or person. And Lord, Your Word says that from time past to time eternity future, You have angel, angels and angel-like creatures that are saying, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy Spirit, Your name is holy. Jesus, You are the Holy One of Israel. You are the One in whom is found no deceit and no sin. You are the One in whom the Father said, This is My beloved Son. I am well pleased with Him. And Lord, we come confidently to Your throne of grace because You perfectly, Lord Jesus, fulfilled all righteousness. Everything that the law said and we could not do, You did. And so we can boldly enter in to a throne of grace with confidence because Jesus is praying for us even now at Your right hand we thank you, we thank you, and we thank you. And all God's people said, 
these uh, verses uh, fixate on two commands. Verse 13, in the Greek, uh, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's command number one. The first part of verse 13 supports that one command. And we're going to look at that. Verse 15, part B, command number two. Be holy yourselves in all your behavior. And everything in verse 14 and around it in verse 15 and also the quote from Leviticus in verse 16 uh, shows us what that looks like or the motive for why we're to be holy in every aspect of our behavior. Now this is a turning point in 1 Peter, because for 12 verses we've been looking at the privileges of salvation, of the rescue mission that Christ has orchestrated, that the Father planned, the Son executed, and the Spirit applies to the hearts of those who are being born again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we have lots of privileges in a treasure trove of gospel promises and now we begin to get some commands be hopeful be holy hope and holiness i want to show you first of all if you have those two words up on the screen those two words hope and holiness i want you to see the connection that uh, maybe not so much in peter but in other places, there is a huge connection between our hope and our holiness. And I want to give you a couple of stories. Well, a story and some song lyrics. First of all, out of a particular Catholic tradition, there's an interview going on in Italian television between the interviewer and a Cistercian abbot. And the question was asked, the abbot, what if you were to realize at the end of your life that atheism is true? That there is no God? Tell me, would it be worth it? What if atheism were true? What if there's no God? What if there's no eternity? What if there's no heaven? And the abbot's answer was this. Holiness Silence and sacrifice are beautiful in themselves. Even without promise of reward, I still have used my life well. End of quote. Now I want to move from a particular Catholic tradition to a, an evangelical Protestant singer that I used to enjoy listening to in the 70s. It's dating me a little bit. And one of my favorite songs at the time, because it was just this little catchy tune and repeated lyrics, is she would say, if there, this is in the lyrics, were never any streets of gold, neither a land where we would never grow old, it's been worth just having the Lord in my heart, living in a world of darkness, but He brought me the light. I love that song at the time, but I would suggest to you that the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John would strongly disagree with that Cistercian abbot in Evie Turnquist, the little Swedish singer who had a wonderful voice and used it greatly for Christ in her era of singing. But let me give you Paul's answer. If he was being interviewed on Italian television... He says in 1 Corinthians 15, if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. And then he quotes the logic that flows from the futility 
of no resurrection future for believers or no past resurrection for Christ. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now that's Paul's answer. Let me give you John's. The Apostle John had this to say, Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we'll be like Him because we'll see Him just as He, Christ, is. And everyone, here's the connection between hope and holiness. Everyone who has this hope in Him, fixed on Him, purifies Himself just as He is pure. You could ask somebody that's an atheist, an agnostic, you know, why do you uh, not sleep around? Why did you get married? Well, my parents got married. Well, why did your parents get married? Well, my grandparents got married. Well, why don't you just sleep around and shack up with anyone? If there's no God and there's no future, why? Let us eat and drink and let's party. Now what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about hope. And we're going to ask two questions in a minute. And then we're going to talk about holiness. And we're going to ask two questions of that. Hopefully we'll get the answer from the text, particularly from verse 13 and verse 15 and verse 16. And then at the end, I want to address a balloon and the Gospel that rescues us even in our infidelity to hope and in our inconsistencies in holiness. So that's where we're going to go with the time we have this morning. Let me ask you a question. How many of you have been saved? Not a trick question. How many of you have been saved? That's good to see so many hands up. Now let me ask you this question. Why is it so hard for us who just raised our hands to be satisfied? Why do so many of our marriages struggle over the long haul? Why do we have such a hard time getting along with family and friends? I'm talking even to the people that just raised their hands, myself included. Why do we carry around so much debt? Why does our resolve to read through the Bible in a year either fall off the bandwagon about the time we hit Leviticus chapter 2? Or if we stick it out and we gut it out, it just becomes a rote checklist. And there's no joy. There's no inexpressible joy. Why do we pray for the lost that aren't saved from the penalty of sin, which is the wrath of God and the lake of fire, and then hold our breath all day, hoping they won't contaminate us in the next cubicle with their endless barrage of whatever. Why do so many of us consistently spend more than we earn? Why do we talk so much as we did this fall about uncommon community as a body and feel so lonely? so ostracized, so disconnected from other believers at GBF, struggling to go deeper than a surface relationship in our care group with our brothers and sisters in Christ? Why do our trials paralyze us more than they should? Why do people, spouses, significant others, parents, children, bosses, pastors, parishioners, you know, just keep going. Disappoint us so easily. Why does life in the here and now never seem to deliver what we hoped it would? Now let me go back and ask the question. How many of you have been saved? Well, you still raise your hand, right? If you've trusted in Christ. But there's the second question. How many of you will be saved? Hmm. less hands go up. It's not a trick question. It's not a trick question. 
fix your hope completely on the grace that will come to you at the revelation of Christ. You see, there is a past salvation. We have been rescued from the penalty of sin. But we, along with the creation, are groaning for the redemption of our sinful bodies. Romans 8, 18-23 tells us. And the reason we answer all of those questions and say, yes, I struggle. I get disappointed. I get hurt. I get disillusioned. I am constantly craving and seldom satisfied. Is because there's a future salvation that hasn't happened yet. And Peter tells these suffering believers that he's writing to people that are being persecuted because they love Jesus and stand for Jesus. He tells them, fixate your hope on future grace. On future grace. Now isn't it interesting, the object. So the question is, what is the object of our hope? Well, the answer is, Let me tell you what it's not, and in other places it is. When I hear people talk about the revelation of Christ, we get into debates about end times regarding the tribulation, the rapture, the millennial kingdom. We we sometimes see passages regarding that we're to fix our hope on Christ. Or on the second coming, more that idea, but... But here, it's a very particular object that we're to fixate completely on. It's the grace that is to be revealed to us. It is future grace. Now, when you believed in Christ, you were freed from the penalty of sin because of grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You weren't worthy of it. You had no right to it. God just chose to be kind to you. To be gracious to you. Because of Christ. It was a gift. But get this. If it all started with grace, it all consummates with grace it never stops being all grace let's think about it this way did god redeem your polluted soul by his grace when you were saved (laughs) absolutely then someday he's going to redeem your sinful body by his grace you know the last several years of my mom's life if you ask her on any given day 24-7, how she was doing, her typical answer was not very good. In fact, it got to be so rote and repetitious that long ago, Marcy and I stopped ever asking her how she was doing. But you see, my mom is now in the presence of Christ. And someday when she receives, when her vile body that will corrupt at Fort Bliss Cemetery, she was all amped up because she's going to be buried on top of her, of her husband. She got excited about that. But when Jesus calls the dead, and the body on its way up in the twinkling of an eye is changed out, you will never see my mom in heaven and ask her how she's doing and hear the answer, not very good. In fact, the words not and good just never will exist in heavenly vocabulary. Well, let me ask you this. Did God remove, give you the forgiveness of sin because of grace when you believed? In the same way, when you lock into future grace, you picture a world, sorry Charlie, you have no job in heaven. No more police. No more breaking of laws. Chris, you just lost your job. 
No more uh, headlines in the El Paso Times like I saw this morning, flu concern or whatever. None of that. Chris just lost his earthly job. I'm sure the Lord will have a great one for him up there. But you see, we're going to be freed because of future grace from antidepressant medication. That goes up. Mike, you, you just lost your job. No, no more surgeries. No more selling of surgical equipment. You see, all of the consequences in the fallout that resulted from Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden are completely taken care of by future grace. And you see, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, brothers and sisters, and to me, that we need to lock into this thing. We need to be thinking more about grace, future grace. And you know what? When you get there, in the presence of Christ, whether you knew Christ (laughs) for an hour like the thief on the cross, or whether you plotted faithfully through clinical depression in a difficult marriage, and it seemed no relief came, whether you're a one-hour Christian on your deathbed, or a 40-year persevering Christian, or somebody that stumbled in the middle, all you're going to look at and say is, it's all grace. It's all grace! It's all you, Lord! It's you. Let me ask you this. Do you live in anticipation of that? Do you do you get amped up about that? You say, Ben, how do I do that? Well, that's our second question. And we get the answer in the first part of verse 13. Notice, there's two participles which modify the main verb, the idea of fixating our hope completely on the grace to be revealed to us, the appearing of Christ, the revelation of Christ. But prepare your minds for action and keep sober in spirit. You say, how do I lock and fixate my attention with the swirl of emails and the debt and the chronic back pain? How in the world, Ben, do I fixate my hope completely on the grace that is future? In this mucky mess I live in called life on planet Earth, outside of the Garden of Eden and before the New Jerusalem. Two things. You do it by being sober and by girding your mind for action. Now let's start with the second one. Just make a couple comments. The word for being sober is literally talking about don't get drunk. Don't get intoxicated. Don't get inebriated. In other words, In a literal sense, don't let alcohol have its deadening and dulling effect on you. But notice the translators added two words. Be sober in what? Spirit. So I think here he's not talking about a literal intoxication. A literal drunkenness. He's speaking metaphorically of allowing the world to intoxicate you. And the world is very intoxicating, is it not? You know, someone, just even take from the world of sensuality. Someone has said that if sensuality was stripped out of advertisement, the entire industry would fall apart at the seams. Or covetousness. You, you can't even... Drive down I-10 this afternoon without being bombarded by the allurement and the attractiveness of this world. And it has a deadening effect on our souls. Our souls are shriveling under the allurements of worldliness. It's like an anesthesia. It's a deadening. It's an intoxicant. It makes us drowsy spiritually. And the Apostle Peter says, you've got to fight that, believer. If you've been born again to a living hope, 
Boy, if you're going to keep your mind fixated on future grace, then you've got to be sober. You're going to have to constantly battle the allurements and the attractiveness and the deadness of this world and its attractions. But then he says that you prepare your mind for action. And, and that, that imagery is, I think in the old King James, it says something like, gird up your loins. Anybody here going to participate like Jeff Irving did a, a year ago in the upcoming 26-mile marathon? I had a fleeting, weird bucket list thought, but it, it quickly passed. Uh, but I bet if you lined up, I don't know where they meet at the top of Trans Mountain Drive or where they start, but I bet you would never find a runner wearing a bathrobe. And he's booking down to the road, and his robe is just flailing up behind him. That is just weird imagery, isn't it? And if you lived in ancient Near Eastern world, you would never go into a work situation or a competitive situation with your long flowing robe just kicking up against the breeze. No, you'd grab it and you'd tie it around your waist. And I think what the Holy Spirit is telling us is we need to take our thoughts and we need to gather them up. We need to gather them up. You know, I, I have, and I don't want to be insensitive here. Insensitive? I don't think unsen- is insensitive a word? Insensitive sounds better here. But I, I think in some ways we all have ADHD. I, I, and I don't mean that, you know, I know Sam or Chris, others could argue that medically. But I'm just saying this. We're all scatterbrained. I mean... You can't go three minutes in today's world without moving from a text to an email to a, what is that, Instagram to, oh my goodness. I mean, can we even sustain a thought for more than 30 seconds in Western culture? And so this this is, this, what, what we're being asked to do is a huge, it is a huge deal. Because we're being asked to gather up the badly fragmented, scatterbrained thoughts of our mind and focus on future grace. Let me talk a little bit about the thoughts in the brain. We're told that our brain can record 800 memories per second. In our lifetime, the brain can store 1 million billion bits of info. I can't even, I'm just reading to you. I can't even fathom that. Did you know, ladies, that your mind, your thoughts, have such influence on you that your body will respond physically to how you're thinking? There have been instances, listen to this, where women have become falsely pregnant just because of the way they were thinking. Really. Their cycle stops. They gain weight. They have morning sickness. In fact, people have experienced relief from asthma, from hay fever, from headaches, from diabetes, from ulcers, from seasickness, from warts, from chronic pain, from arthritis, all from being given sugar pills with no medicinal qualities. Because when they were given those pills, they thought they were real. So you see, the relief that came didn't come because of any medicinal substance in the pill. It came because of a change of thinking, a perception. Oh, our thinking, beloved, is so influential. Here's the way Proverbs 4.23 puts it. He says, above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. Guard your thoughts. Guard your mind. 
guard your affections. Because you do what you do, and you feel what you feel because you think what you think. You know, if you live in an old agrarian culture, and you have poison eking out into individual homes through buckets, and the cows are dying in the field from water drawn, you don't go out and you don't try to solve the problem at the field level or at the washing the clothes level at the front steps of your house. You go to the source, the wellspring. There's a well problem. The water's been poisoned before it gets into the homes, before it gets into the fields. And that's what Solomon is telling us above all else. Guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. Tie down the loose ends of your mind. Get your priorities right. Get your mind screwed down. Did you know that nobody talks to you as much as you do? The number one preacher that you listen to is yourself. And did you know that you and I are either always preaching to ourselves or we're listening to ourselves? It's really one of those two things. And the Holy Spirit says that we need to lock into future grace that will be revealed at the appearing of Christ. The second coming of Christ. And this sort of thing, that's why I have the word discipline in the title this morning. It takes some effort. It's hard. Controlling your thoughts, beloved, is hard work. It's hard work. Let me ask um, let me ask you this. Is, is it possible? And I know we've talked a lot about some of the struggles of living in this fallen world this morning, but is it possible that one reason we don't spend more time longing for Christ's return? fixating on future grace is that we've got our bucket list lord yeah i do believe theoretically that someday i'll be with you in heaven but i want to get married first i want to see the cowboys win a super bowl first i want to run a marathon first i want to try my own business first i you know i i honestly think that many of us myself included are so in love with life, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, that we really have lost perspective. That we would almost have a twinge of regret if, if, if we knew that Christ was coming back later today before the football games were over at 6 or 7 or 8. You happen to know that I kind of know the times. See? <laughs> are you serious? I mean, think about the Apostle John. He gets exiled. He's the one of the twelve, or one of the eleven, that isn't uh, martyred immediately at some point. He's just exiled to the island of Patmos. You know, just to live out his life in isolation. And uh, he gets this vision of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he's writing this stuff down. We have it. The Apocalypse. Revelation, the whole book. And you know what he says at the end? Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. You think that the Apostle John was fixating his hope completely on future grace? Oh my. That is such a sadness, even in my own heart to know how little I long for heaven, for future grace. When God is just waiting to lavish grace upon grace upon grace. And after 10,000 years, it's only begun. <laughs> it, it's not even a millisecond. In the early 1950s, there was a lady by the name of Florence Chadwick who tried to become the first woman to swim the 21-mile Catalina Channel off of Long Beach, California. 
And uh, she set out from shore, and she headed out, and she made it four, six, eight, finally 12 hours, and she was getting exhausted. And finally, at 16 hours, she was utterly and completely spent. You see, there had been this fog bank. And she could not see the spotter boat which was leading her. And she couldn't see the land because of the fog. And she finally said, after 16 exhausting hours, pull me out of the water. Do you realize that she was actually pulled out of the water a few hundred yards from the beach? And she said this afterwards. She said, I, if I had seen the goal, I could have made it. In fact, two months later, on a clear day, the fog removed. She broke the record and made it. Because she could see. You know, I think some of us are at 16 mile marker 8 or 16 hour and we're saying, pull me up. I can't do this Christian thing anymore. I can't do this marriage thing anymore. I can't do this parenting thing anymore. I can't do this GBF uncommon community thing anymore. Do you realize, beloved, that we need to just fixate our hope on future grace? It's right there. It's right there. So there's hope. But secondly, there's a holiness. So we're going to ask two questions about verses 15 and 16. What is holiness? And what is the compelling reason for holiness? What comes into your mind when you think about holiness? Some of you might think about morality, the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. And that would be uh, somewhat true. I mean, if God is faithful and He cannot lie, then you and I shouldn't lie or commit adultery, right? If God is loving, then we shouldn't kill or steal. You see, we we typically, when we think of holiness, when we think of this idea in the middle of verse 15, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, we typically think of right living of moral living. But do you realize that in Peter, the context of holiness is bigger than that? It's higher than that. Look at verse 16. It's interesting that Peter quotes from Leviticus, the book we usually uh, tend to skip in our daily Bible reading. Full, Full of rules. Full of rules and regulations and ordinances for the Jewish people of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. But he quotes here, You shall be holy, for I am holy. And we see that, I think, in Leviticus chapter 11. I think it's quoted in other passages in Leviticus, more or less, más o menos. But what's interesting is that Leviticus doesn't talk too much about holy people. It talks about holy lampstands and holy tables and uh, holy ladies' utensils or pots. So try the, the moral definition of holiness on that one. Would you rather eat at a A moral table or an immoral table? Who would you rather have a a moral lampstand in your living room or an immoral? I mean, that doesn't work, does it? So you have to think a little bit in the context of Leviticus. And what we see is that God repeatedly follows you, my covenant people, the Jews, be holy because I. I, your God, am holy. I, your God, am holy. You see, the root word in Hebrew for holy means separate or set apart. And so, 
God is set apart from all created beings. He is unique. He's in another category. There's nobody like Him. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2 says, There is no one holy like the Lord. So what does it mean to have a holy table or a holy pot? Well, here's the way you have to go with that. It's a holy object because it's set apart for God's use. And so you take your table to the priest. And the priest uses your table in a tabernacle. A place for worship. For fellowship offerings. For God. For worshiping God. So what would make the table holy? The fact that it belongs to God. And what makes you holy? What makes me holy? Because we belong to God. And I suggest to you that many uh, Christians, whether cultural Christians or real Christians that have been born again, uh, really don't elevate this beyond the level of morality. In other words, we, we just think, you know what? I'm going to be holy, I'm going to be moral because I feel a sense of duty. Uh, It makes me feel good about myself because I stayed away from certain things or I did certain things or I would make my mom proud of me or my godly grandfather happy about me. Or... You could just be a pragmatist. You could do moralism just because honesty is the what? It's the best policy, right? So you're starting up a business and you're like, you know what? It's just proper to be honest. Not to lie, not to fudge on the numbers. You don't want to get caught. You don't want to pay the penalty of prison or a fine or embarrassment. Or getting sued. But you see, in all of those cases, you are being moral for basically selfish reasons. But you see, there's another approach. To do things not out of a sense of morality, although that's included in holiness, but out of a heart that belongs to God and realizes that you are associated with a holy God. Let me, let me paint a picture, a little image. I think you moms could appreciate this story. Imagine there's a poor single mother. And she has one child. And from the time her son um, comes into the world, she says, you know what, I'm going to teach him to care for the poor. Uh, I want him to always tell the truth. And I want him to always work hard. And so... He's, she's got it. The trifecta. She teaches him charity, honesty, industry, care for the poor, always tell the truth, work hard. And this single mother doesn't have many marketable skills. She doesn't have a college education. She does the best she can. She works three jobs. And she teaches him honesty, charity, and industry. And you know what? She works herself to the bone weekdays weekends weeknights sends him to college he gets a degree he graduates and because of her hard work on his behalf she gets a six-figure job starting out he does so here's what happens the day he lands the job right out of college he texts his mom and he says this mom I'm probably going to send you a Christmas card now and again. I may talk to you now and then, but I really don't want to have much to do with you. I really don't need you. And she says, aghast, why? And he says, well, I always take care of the poor. I'm honest and I work very hard. So I'm doing all the things you want me to do. And that's what's really important. That's what you taught me. Why do I have to have a relationship with you now? I really don't want to talk to you anymore. 
How do you think she would respond to that? I think she'd find that traumatizing, horrible. Now, think about this. Children of God, if you are a child of God through adoption into His family by grace, or if you're not, you're still given everything by your Creator who made you, placed you on this planet, gave you air to breathe, the ability to taste and enjoy a good latte on a cold winter morning. God's given you everything. And uh, you could say to Him, well... I don't need God, but I've got morality. That's what's really important. You know, that's just like the son saying, Mom, I'll send you a Christmas card once in a blue moon, but I don't really want relationship with you. And I just want to say, and I hope you'll take the time to look at this, Leviticus, the quote in verse 16 emphasizes holiness in all our behavior, verse 15, because we belong to God. We belong to God. So what becomes the dominant, compelling reason for holiness? It is our association with God. Let me give you one example, and then we'll move to the balloon illustration shortly. Uh, Here's a principle that is born out of this idea that the reason we're to be holy in all our behavior is because of our association with God, because we belong to God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20, part of that says, you are not your own, you have been bought with a what? With a price. And that's talking about the context of sexual purity. Uh, But what he's saying there is, The reason that you are pure and holy and set apart is because you've been purchased with a price, even the precious blood of Christ, as we'll get into in verse 18 of 1 Peter chapter 1, probably maybe in two weeks. Um, Let me give you an illustration. How many of you have a boss? Raise your hand if you have a boss. Okay. Okay. In Ephesians 6, I think it's in verses 5 to 9, the Apostle Paul says, and of course that's talking about masters and slaves, the closest thing we have to compare that with today is employee and employer. But he says, do your work heartily, not with eye service or man pleasers, but you do it as unto who? As unto the Lord. Now, if you're working for yourself, you only do what's necessary to make the money or to get more money or to get a raise or to get in the inner circle because they say it's not what you know, it's who you know, all of that. But if your goal, whether you're living or dying, is to make it your ambition to please Christ, to do your work heartily as unto the Lord, whether you get the accolades, or you get passed over for the promotion, you're free. It transforms the way you do your work. Because you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for the Lord and others. Now, I want to close with with my balloon. (laughs) Because as I prepared this sermon... I, in the last three nights, I think I probably had about 10 or 11 hours of sleep between the three nights. I had a lot of insomnia. Obviously, a lot of that is related to my mom's death and all kinds of family coming in and lots and lots of things happening this coming week. And, and there were moments, there were hours where I wasn't trusting in future grace. You know, I could... I could um, Every week you could come to GBF and uh, I could say, be sexually pure, love your neighbor, forgive that care group member that offended you, Uh, give more money to the church, Uh, love your wife, submit to your husband, train up your child in the way he should go, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and you know, just give you a little boost, pop you up, right? 
little another little kind of sermonette, give you a little pep talk, go rah rah, go get them. Here's the problem: when I pop you up, you fall down, right? And pretty soon you might get discouraged and say, "Man, I'm just tired of this bouncing." I want you to go back to the text because this is a very important, very important word. The beginning of verse 13, there's one word and it's therefore. Therefore. What has he been doing for 12 verses? He's been talking about being born again. He's been talking about our future inheritance. He's been talking about God's protection of us in our trials and suffering. He's been talking about our faith and love and trust in the one we have not yet seen. He's been talking about receiving the outcome of our salvation. What is he doing? He's taking us back to grace. Where it all started, how it continues, and where it's all going to end. Because I can't tell you that I honestly had my heart fixated on future grace the last 24 hours. I can tell you that I worried and had some anxiety. Um, so you either trust or you worry. Do you know that verse? Philippians 4, 6, and 7. So I think what, what the Holy Spirit is doing is He's saying don't leave the Gospel behind in your rearview mirror. I, here's what I think happens a lot of times when we uh, come to know Christ. And I love the navigators and other discipleship ministries. But, you know, you call on the name of the Lord and ask Him to save you. And then right away somebody says, okay, you need to start memorizing Scripture. Let's get the balloon again. Start reading your Bible. You need to pray Acts, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, Supplication. Yep, got to get that one in. Oh, you need to start witnessing. Oh, you need to join a care group. Oh, <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about? Just, I mean, yeah, it's by grace, but then it's hitting the balloon. I think the gospel, the grace, both saving grace and future grace, is more like a, I want to call this a balloon, filled with helium. You see, the motive that rescues us from legalism or despair, from self-righteousness or persistent guilt, is the grace that we have in Christ. So now that we're into these commands in Peter, and we will be intermittently for months to come, let's not put God's grace in the rearview mirror. Brother, brother. amen?